All right. Hello, Nikki. Hi, Lev. Hello, hello. Morning, or afternoon, or evening. Good to see you all again. Yeah. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful to, to see you guys and to have you all join us. Um, so, yeah, greetings and uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, once again, to another of our Dream Destination webinars. This is obviously the first time that we've connected in 2021. And um, yeah, we'd all like to take the opportunity to wish you all the very best for the year ahead. Uh, while it's been great to enjoy some of these special countries virtually, uh, we sincerely hope that there is a lot more actual travel in the near future for all of us. Uh, also, I'm sure that uh, many of you will have read that going forward through 2021, we'll now be showcasing a destination every two weeks um, instead of once a week. Um, so yeah, that's every two weeks. Um, we'll now be featuring our Dream Destination webinars and, um, and that'll be for the, for the entire year. I also wanted to extend a special thanks to everyone actually joining us live today. Um, we're all well aware that uh, we're competing for a little airtime with a rather important person who is being inaugurated right now. Um, and for those who are not watching us live, but who are choosing to rather watch the recording, um, there's definitely no hard feelings. Uh, we all know this is a rather significant and important moment for not only everyone in the United States of America, but across the globe. Right, on to today's webinar and guest speaker. Lev, it's uh, really wonderful to have you back to showcase your home country, Canada. And um, yeah, fantastic. And for those of you who are not familiar with Lev, he was uh, born in Russia, now resides just north of Toronto, Canada, and has spent a lot of time exploring, educating people and collecting loads of records related to one of Canada's most famous parks, Algonquin. Lev also gave a fabulous talk on Mexico back in August last year, uh, which I know many of you attended. And uh, during the pre-COVID days, he spent a lot of his time leading bird watching tours for Rock Jumper to various corners of the globe um, and hopes to do so in the not too distant future as well. Today, Lev is going to showcase Canada during the winter with a special focus on owls, which is certainly a favorite family for many of us. Um, and then just quickly before we start, uh, just to recap that we'll end the webinar today with a Q&A session with Nikki and Lev. And uh, we always love fielding your questions uh, on that front. So um, yeah, just to recap, you can just use the Q&A box or the chat function provided for, for that. Um, yeah, and on that note, it's uh, over to you, Lev. All right, thanks a lot, Keith. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be back. It, uh, and it's great to be showcasing uh, Canada for sure and, uh, and owls, which are one of my favorite groups of birds. And I know the same is, uh, is true for a lot of folks. So we'll get right into the meat and potatoes of it here. I've got a bit of a, an itinerary, if, uh, if you will, at, for the talk. It's a little bit different than uh, the other webinars uh, that I, well, the one that I've done on Mexico and some of the other ones that we've done before. It, uh, so there's four parts that I've made. Uh, the first, uh, we're going to talk about the biology of four northern owl species. So uh, some popular birds that, uh, that uh, reside here in Canada and in the northern U.S. that uh, a lot of folks want to see. Uh, I'll touch briefly on uh, our Manitoba Owls tour. I'll take you through a little uh, virtual journey uh, and some of the birds and mammals that, uh, that we see on that tour. And then uh, what I'm going to do, and I'm kind of excited about this because it's uh, pretty neat, is uh, talk about how to find owls uh, near your home. So uh, obviously a lot of places right now are in lockdown and travel isn't, uh, isn't too possible. Um, but uh, owls can be found relatively easily in, uh, in most places um, in the United States or Europe and places like that. And I'll uh, explain to you how, uh, how you can use some tips and tricks uh, to find some owls uh, near your home. And uh, last but not least, we'll touch briefly on uh, owl watching etiquette. So what to do and what not to do when looking at these very special birds. So uh, just a little intro on Canada. It's a fairly uh, fairly well-known well -known place. It's a great big country. Um, but some interesting facts, 60% uh, of the, the land in Canada is boreal forest. So it's uh, one of our most important uh, regions, not only for wildlife, but also for resource extraction, uh, which is a big part of Canada's economy. So a lot of oil is found in the boreal forest region. The oil sands, of course, of Alberta are quite famous for that. And uh, a lot of timber and uh, forestry is done in the boreal forest region as well. Uh, we have 16 owl species uh, in the country. 
I really wanted to talk about all of them today, but um, that would have taken many hours. So we've chosen four sort of star species, uh, but we do have quite a, a good diversity out here. Um, that goes from anything, the little tiny Northern pygmy owl and flammulated owl, which we have out West to snowy owl and great gray owl, burrowing owl in the prairies, uh, spotted owl we have um, very few now, but uh, they do exist. And those are amongst uh, about 460 breeding birds uh, that, uh, that Canada hosts. Um, half of that disappears uh, in the winter. Uh, so it's something that uh, right now it's actually about minus 10 degrees centigrade and snowing. So most birds uh, do prefer not to be in that uh, and they leave. But uh, Canada is a very important nursery for a lot of uh, boreal breeding birds uh, like warblers, flycatchers, um, vireos and things like that. Um, so together with the United States, uh, Mexico and Central America, it's a, a place of conservation concern when we're talking about uh, those species. So we're going to get uh, right into it here with our first owl, the least owl-like of all the owls that we're going to be talking about today, the northern hawk owl. So the hawk owl, which I'm going to refer to it as for the rest of the presentation, it's not quite... Uh, it's not related to the hawk owls or bubuks of, uh, of Asia there. It's in its own. It's the only sort of surviving member of, uh, of its genus, Cernia. And uh, it is quite a special owl. It's quite different from, uh, from any of the other owls that we have in Canada. All right. Uh, this uh, is its range. So it is a circumboreal species. It exists in Europe and Asia as well. Uh, it's tied mostly to boreal forest type uh, landscapes, but they are montane in some areas. Um, but coniferous forest seems to be something that uh, that the species prefers, as well as poplar forest here in Canada. This is sort of a typical view of, uh, of a northern hawk owl, perhaps uh, someone's first view. Uh, they're very easy to uh, spot, I should say. Um, they are quite a bit, not very common, they're low density, but uh, when you see one, uh, you will know because they sit right out in the open at the tops of trees, uh, very easy to detect. Sometimes pretty frustrating because uh, when you're driving along, you'll see one way off in the distance, uh, sitting at the top of a tree and uh, there's not really a way to get closer to it. So it can be frustrating, uh, but they are certainly one of the easiest owls to, uh, to spot. They uh, really like to perch on man-made structures, uh, much to the bane of uh, photographers. Um, this was one that was hunting a bird feeder in Northern Quebec. You can see it's sitting on a uh, rather ugly piece of equipment. Um, they also really like to perch on uh, wires and uh, power poles. So in a lot of these places that they like to hunt, uh, sort of open areas, marshes, fields, there's not really too many natural high perches, but uh, wires and posts uh, certainly do the job. But if you are lucky, uh, you every once in a while get one sitting on a nice natural perch like this one on a big uh, dead white birch snag which is quite nice. You can see there, they sit fairly prominently uh, up, uh, up at the very top, similar to uh, a shrike. Um, here's one that's in the woods. It is a, a very hawk-like owl. It's a good name for the bird. It's got a long tail, um, sort of a lithe body. Uh, really the only thing that uh, identifies it as an owl is that great big head. And uh, they're not very large. They're maybe a foot long. Uh, the females are bigger than the males, which is true for, uh, for most, if not all, owls. Uh, in flight, they are very hawk-like as well. You can see the tail is very long. The wings are very long and narrow. Okay, I'll show you another picture here. A uh, good uh, show of the wings there. So very long. Not a bird that's uh, working in the interior of the forest. Uh, it's really an open spaces uh, predator that uh, is very quick, but not particularly maneuverable. Here are some important food items for northern hawk owls. Uh, one of the most important food items is the little creature there on the left, the uh, meadow vole. So meadow voles are very small uh, mouse-like mammals that uh, go through population cycles uh, throughout their range. In many places, especially near uh, cities or agricultural areas, their numbers are fairly high throughout the year. So what ends up happening is uh, if you look at the animal on the bottom right of the screen that looks very similar to the meadow vole, it's called the red-backed vole. That is a boreal forest species, okay? It lives in forested areas, not open areas like meadow voles. And they have this four year, give or take four to six year cycle where their population booms and then it crashes. 
So the movements of hawk owls and other species of boreal owls, um, including boreal owls, uh, depend on uh, sort of the abundance of these redback voles. And when they come south, out of the range of the redback, they feed heavily on these meadow voles. But hawk owls are quite versatile. Um, they can catch fast moving prey like birds. Uh, in some years when there's a lot of finches in the boreal forest, but not very many voles, the, uh, the hawk owls will actually stay in the north and feed on finches. But they can also catch uh, larger and uh, more difficult prey. This is one that I uh, was very lucky to witness catch a morning dove. Um, and doves, as uh, most of us know, are very fast birds. They're very maneuverable. They're difficult to catch uh, for anything, not to mention an owl. But uh, this species is uh, quite good at what it does. And another interesting uh, behavior that this species exhibits is food caching. Okay, so a lot of owls will uh, will capture more food that they can kill than they can eat or kill and uh, they'll sort of sit on it for a while uh, but this species will actually have several areas where they'll put food um, that they have uh, that they've killed that they can't eat so they'll kill more than they can eat and store food in a variety of different places uh, the behavior is not very well studied um, but theoretically a lot of them remember where most of their food items are i've certainly seen the species um, use several different uh, hiding places. This is, uh, it hid the morning dove actually in the crotch of this tree. And uh, yeah, so it seems like a very, uh, very advanced food caching behavior for owls, uh, which is very, very cool to see. And uh, amongst all the owls that I'm gonna be talking to you about today, uh, this one is certainly the least wary of people. Uh, it's very curious. It uh, will allow up close approach uh, all the time, essentially. They'll even, uh, when you're snowshoeing through the bush um, and if there's one, they'll often come over and sort of have a look. Probably not so much interested in you as much as the uh, voles and other small mammals you might be uh, disturbing as you walk along. This one sort of landed right beside me and assessed the situation for a while before taking off. Uh, but certainly a very, uh, very engaging creature and uh, always a joy to watch. Uh, this is a scene that we saw um, on our previous Manitoba Owls tour in the in 2020 in March and uh, it was one that was calling okay so in the spring uh, they do call they're quite vocal um, the male does a display flight a harrier like flight where he kind of floats along with very exaggerated wing beats and calls of course he does this during the day um, I've never seen it personally they don't do it only for a short amount of time um, but uh, it is something to see but this this was uh, a larger bird maybe a female and it was uh, calling uh, quite quite a bit and uh, defending uh, perhaps a possible nesting cavity or maybe a food cache. And it was right behind our hotel, our resort on uh, Hecla Island. So a guest actually found it by going just for a short little walk outside the resort. So that's how Manitoba is. And then to make matters even more interesting, we saw this amazing interaction that the owl had with a pileated woodpecker, uh, which is just about the same size. Um, the owl didn't really care much about the woodpecker. It didn't really pay it much attention, but clearly the woodpecker uh, wanted the owl out of its home. It may have been using uh, a roosting cavity that the pileated was using as a potential nest or maybe a, a food cache. So very cool to see. Often you just see them sitting up in a tree and doing not much, uh, but when you do get to see them uh, exhibiting other behaviors, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Here's one that uh, that's in the summer, not not a season that a lot of folks see hawk owls. Um, this I, I took this photo a long time ago on the Manitoba border uh, on the Ontario side, and it was uh, actually attending young. Uh, this is what the baby looks like. Uh, this one is almost independent. It was one of three. You can see it's not got very much growing left to do. Just uh, some head feathers and uh, he'll be off on his way. All right, moving along, the uh, probably the most popular owl that uh, that we get here in uh, in Canada and Manitoba on our tour is the great gray, uh, for obvious reasons. It's very large and uh, very uh, well. It's the tallest owl in North America um, by size, not not so much by weight. And uh, its range is quite interesting. You can see here it's a it's a transboreal uh, species. It goes all across Europe and Asia there, but it actually stops. Um, in far western Quebec, uh, they haven't really uh, gone up to the northeast part of Canada, even though there's uh, quite a bit of habitat uh, there for them. It's not dissimilar from other places. So something that research is, uh, more research is, 
required, excuse me. Uh, this is sort of your typical first view of a great gray owl. Uh, once you see the shape, uh, you will never forget it. It's a very distinctive shape. It's this big loaf of bread like uh, bird. It's two, two feet tall, uh, often sits right in the open, uh, especially in Manitoba and uh, places further north where the crows leave in the winter. Uh, they get harassed by crows a lot and uh, they sort of tend to avoid areas where there's lots of crows, but in Manitoba, uh, they'll, they'll hunt through through the day if it's a cloudy day because there's uh, uh, not very many birds to bother them. Ravens seem to ignore them. They seem to know that uh, they mean no harm. Here's another typical view uh, on our tour there. Massive bird, uh, huge facial discs, uh, you know, for hearing prey underneath the snow. A very imposing size. You can see it from a, a mile away. But uh, it's very light. So it's two feet tall, but it only weighs... Uh, the biggest ones, maybe a big, big female, weighs just over two pounds. And a small male might weigh, you know, like 1.6 or 1.7 pounds, just a, a kilo or so. Um, yeah, so quite uh, quite light, lightweight, even though it's uh, it's large. And once again, it's another one that likes to perch on man-made objects, like wires. Uh, but I find that this species, more than the ones that I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, does like to use natural perches, often at... Uh, at quite a low level. Uh, this was one that George Armistead and I saw just before the official tour last year. As you can see, as it uh, flies along, the shape is very different from the hawk owl shape. It's got very broad wings. Uh, wingspan is uh, four to five feet, usually closer to the four foot mark. And uh, you can see the little legs dangling there in this, in this photo. And uh, George first initially thought when we saw this that it may have been carrying a rabbit. But no, it's got these little tiny, tiny furry legs, and that sort of hints to uh, to what its main prey is. Okay, uh, this is a species that a lot of times is uh, referenced to uh, hunt during the day, and certainly uh, they do hunt during the day on a variety of different occasions. For example, in the northern parts of the range, they have little choice. Um, there's only a few hours of night, so they have to hunt during the day. But birds that are in good condition, uh, that are not starving. Uh, they tend to avoid hunting in the middle of the day and they sort of retire and sleep for, uh, for a few hours like this one was doing. Uh, and when they're doing that, they're hard to find. So when we look for them, we look for them usually at dusk or right at dawn. Uh, and they tend to be active till about 10, 10 in the morning is my magic time. Um, you might wonder, you know, why, you know, why if they're so gigantic, why can't they just hunt all day and uh, not be, uh, you know, not be bothered by anything, but um, they are aware of their small uh, quote unquote weight um, and they're very alert. You'll often see them if they are hunting during the day, if they're food pressured or starving, you'll see them looking up a lot. And uh, we actually saw this, we were watching two uh, during our tour and they both started looking up and there was a very distant bald eagle above them. Okay. So this is a potential predator for this bird. And, uh, the owls were sort of looking up and one of the owls did this cryptic posture. So uh, you might be familiar of those, uh, those viral YouTube videos of owls like going like this to try and hide from, uh, from their predators. Uh, great gray owls also exhibit this behavior. Uh, it's quite ridiculous looking as you can see in this photo, um, but they, uh, they do do that to try and hide. And uh, once the eagle took off, both owls that we were watching went to sleep in the forest. They didn't want anything to do with that. So... This is uh, what their primary prey is. For a large bird, they are very, very specialized for feeding on voles. So it's red-backed voles on the left and the meadow vole on the right. This is one of um, those owls that doesn't tend to have a very diverse prey base. Sometimes on accident, they'll eat things up to the size of a short-tailed weasel or maybe a small rabbit. Um, a couple of birds have been recorded, but most of the time uh, they're focusing specifically on voles. And they hunt uh, mostly from perches, you know, so they'll just be sitting and waiting. You can see the little feet there in that photo. The claws are relatively uh, short and blunt compared to other owls, uh, just for grabbing voles. And uh, so they hunt from perches like this, just sitting and waiting, but they also have another hunting technique, which is very neat to watch. And this is what they're famous for, uh, called coursing. So in places in the far north where some of their habitat uh, disappears under snow, for example, short trees that are six or seven feet high disappear under snow. Um, these owls don't really have a perch that they can use. So they fly 
uh, very, very slowly and sort of exaggeratedly over uh, a field listening for, for voles underneath the snow. And they can hear voles up to a meter and a half or even more underneath, uh, underneath the layer of snow. Once they hear something that they're interested in, they go into uh, this sort of controlled gliding fall towards their prey. You can see this is a bird that uses its tail a lot. It's something that most owls don't do. It's got a very big tail that it uh, uses to fan out and sort of go very, very slowly towards its prey. As it sort of nears its prey, it turns its head kind of at a 45 degree angle from its wings and looks down to make sure it, uh, it's all spaced out correctly. And the, uh, the final descent is uh, very quick. It's almost like a gannet or a booby kind of plunging into the snow. And just at the last minute, you can see those little tiny bunny legs come out and, uh, and then the owl disappears underneath the snow. Uh, this is a famous behavior that great gray owls exhibit. Uh, this is how they catch their food um, in places where they live up in the north. For this reason, they can, uh, they can be one of the only birds around for many, many kilometers uh, up in the heart of the boreal forest. Uh, they can go up to a meter underneath the snow to grab their food. They can puncture through an ice crust that could hold a 120 pound person. Um, so they are very well adapted to living in these extreme conditions and hunting these small mammals in a very particular way. So once they've plunged through the snow, again, they're very, very cautious. They'll sit there, even if they haven't caught anything, for five to 10 minutes, sort of looking around, making sure that there's no uh, predators around. Great horned owls, which are smaller in kind of height, but uh, weigh almost twice as much as great gray owls are potential predators. So they have to keep an eye out for that. And uh, once they're gone, they, uh, they can take off. And uh, this one was unsuccessful, as you can see, but uh, they'll try again as, as many times as they have to. In the summer, when they're breeding, they hunt during the day, even on sunny days, uh, because they have to feed their babies. They usually have, you know, three or four babies, and about half of that survives to fledging. This is, uh, this is sort of their uh, typical habitat, a uh, winter road in northern Manitoba. As you can see, there's not very many places to nest. Uh, owls of all kinds, uh, they don't build nests. Uh, some build like little scrapes in the ground like a snowy owl, but great gray owls need uh, other places to build their nests. They can't make their own nest like, uh, like hawks can. So in this sort of landscape that you see before you, where's a good place to put a nest? Well, if you look right there in this big poplar snag, it uh, doesn't really look like anything, but if you have a closer look, and uh, look at where the arrow is pointing. Uh, there is a female great gray owl incubating in this hole that's about this big. Uh, so pretty amazing, pretty amazing birds, uh, adaptable to their, their environment. These pictures were taken by a colleague of mine who was doing uh, atlasing for the Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. And uh, she was kind enough to let us use her pictures. This was uh, a baby great gray owl that I saw in Algonquin Park. This is actually one of the, one of the first nestings ever recorded in the park in 2010. Uh, pretty goofy looking birds when they're small, uh, very cute. Here's another picture, um, probably a couple of uh, weeks, maybe three or four weeks away from uh, becoming independent, this one. And here's a, a neat picture. It's a female delivering food to the baby. The male um, delivers food to the female and she'll come and deliver it to the baby. You can see her eyes are closed to uh, prevent damage from the uh, very aggressive baby. It's quite cute. And here's one uh, doing a bit of a stretch there. You can see that big broad tail that's so important to this species. All right, moving quite along. We've got the snowy owl up next. This is certainly one of those uh, birds that anybody can recognize regardless of whether or not you're a birder. So it seems like a bit of a cliche of a bird, but they have a very cool uh, suite of behaviors and, uh, and stuff that's uh, not often known about them. So hopefully there'll be some interesting stuff in here. You'll see that uh, their range is quite a bit different from the other owls I've talked about so far. They are truly an Arctic species. So no boreal forest for them, uh, unless they're spending the winter somewhere in a, a big opening. Um, they are a tundraic breeder um, that comes in varying numbers uh, south to spend the winter. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is your typical view of a snowy owl. Of all the owls that, um, that we're gonna talk about and that I've already talked about, this one is the one that uh, really likes to use man-made perches, uh, unfortunately for photographers. So power posts are much loved 
the ground. Um, this one was in a recently tilled onion field. Um, kind of nice, but kind of strange looking. And uh, this one has its own lighting system there. You can see on the right on this uh, piece of farm equipment and a fan. So this is kind of like the, uh, the Marriott, I guess, of uh, snowy owls. Uh, but every once in a while, you do get them on a nice perch like this one uh, on an old stone foundation of a house in a farmland area here in Ontario. Now, here's that picture again. I'll show you of the snowy owl. And, you know, you'd think that, oh, it's a distinctive bird. You know, you can't really mistake it for any other bird. But there is an owl that is very little known that you'll see there on the right. And uh, it is very similar to the snowy owl. It has a white facial disc. It's very pale, but it's got ear tufts. Uh, okay, it's a different species. Uh, it can be at a distance confused for a snowy owl. It's a great horned owl. Okay, so this is one of the most common owls in North America. But this subspecies, which uh, is sort of a, a Canadian central Canada um, endemic, more or less, the subarcticus or subarctic great horned owl is very snowy like. And uh, to me, it's sort of the holy grail of these northern owls. You know, I've seen lots of snowy and gray gray and whatnot. And you can really, if you know where to go, you can see them at any time uh, you want. But these are truly rare, these subarctic great horned owls. Um, they're difficult to find. Most of their range is uh, quite, uh, quite inaccessible. So it's always a treat to see. And Manitoba is the best place probably to see, uh, to see subarcticus. Um, as we speak, there's one in a Winnipeg City Park, which unfortunately we won't be able to see this year, but uh, hopefully next year uh, if we do, uh, if the owl tours run. I'm hopeful. Uh, so back to the snowy, uh, they're the most variable of our owls in terms of their color. Uh, this is the darkest sort of form, uh, first year female. This is an adult male. This is sort of the age class that everybody wants to see. It takes about five years or more for a male to be this pale, okay? Here's another one. Uh, striking birds, really. No, no words can really do them justice or pictures. Um, these males do tend to spend the winter further north than their female counterparts. So I do see them more often in Manitoba than I do here in Ontario, which is just a bit, and where I live in Ontario, which is just a bit further south. Uh, but every once in a while, they do drift our way. Uh, this is sort of a more typical snowy owl that, uh, that you're likely to see. Some barring, uh, but overall quite pale. Flying around, you can see they're, uh, they're very well made for open spaces. They've got really long and narrow wings like a hawk owl designed for high speed. Um, their talons uh, are not like the great gray owl's little bunny talons. They are very large and extremely powerful. Uh, made for holding medium or large sized prey until it stops moving. So definitely a very, very uh, fearsome predator. And it's the heaviest of our owls. Uh, it can weigh over three pounds, okay, which is twice as much as the great gray. Their food is variable. They are not a specialist on, uh, on anything really except lemmings in the far north where they breed. A lemming is a small uh, hamster or vole-like animal that just like voles, they go through uh, population declines and increases uh, throughout uh, different cycles uh, in different places. So that's what they're eating in the summer. Uh, but throughout the year, they eat uh, a variety of different things, medium-sized mammals, uh, birds, up to large waterfowl. Okay, um, so it's very, uh, very diverse. You can see here, this snowy owl in the upper right-hand portion of your screen is spending her winter in a marina here in Toronto, right in the city. And this one here in Cape May, New Jersey, was spending the winter on the beach. Uh, these birds are not feeding on voles here. They are feeding on uh, waterfowl, okay, which is very different prey uh, from a vole. It's much tougher to catch, um, but they can certainly do it. So this amazing photo was taken by a local photographer here uh, in southern Ontario. And it's a big female snowy owl eating an adult Canada goose. Okay, so this is atypical prey. They don't always eat them, but they can. Um, and uh, so it's uh, a very impressive bird, extremely powerful and uh, capable of taking down large prey. And uh, this is kind of a neat, neat picture, an experience that I wanted to share. Um, so often it's written that snowy owls hunt during the day. Sometimes people say they only hunt during the day. Um, and again, just like great gray owls, a healthy bird will not hunt in the middle of the day unless the opportunity presents itself. Okay, they like to sleep. Um, in the middle of the day. The reason you see them a lot during the day is because they sleep in open areas on, on tops of power poles and, uh, and uh, in the middle of fields. But like this bird here, uh, sometimes prey just 
shows up at, uh, at whatever time and you have to take advantage. So it's a little red squirrel there on the left encountered this sleeping snowy owl. And as squirrels do, um, it decided that, oh, well, the owl, you know, it no longer has this element of surprise. So it started this mobbing behavior, which a lot of, you know, squirrels and birds often do to sleeping owls and hawks and things like that. Uh, but what it didn't realize was uh, that the snowy owl <laughs> is a very fast moving owl and it leapt into action right away. Uh, you can see here the squirrel tried briefly to bury itself underneath the snow. You can see the um, the little disturbance in the snow just uh, to the left of the owl's right wing there. Um, I watched this play out. The squirrel tried to escape the owl. It had maybe 100 meters to go before it hit the forest. Uh, the owl missed several times, but eventually it uh, gained enough altitude and uh, very quickly caught up to the squirrel. And uh, that was the end of that. So uh, an amazing hunt. Uh, something that uh, is, is always on the list of things that you want to see when you're watching these birds. And it, watching them hunt, uh, they are actually quite often uh, successful. So pretty neat to see. Here's another impressive shot <laughs> of one chasing a duck. Uh, it's really the only owl that, uh, that I could think of that will catch and pursue waterfowl at full level flight during all times of the day. Uh, this one was not successful, uh, but uh, they are often... Uh, capable of catching such prey. So very cool to see. Really though, dusk is the time that uh, these owls come to life. They're perching, they're perching on low perches and uh, flying around. Uh, they course also like a great gray owl sometimes and uh, just a joy to see. And this is the time of day that we look for them on our Manitoba tour. Here's another picture of, uh, of one. This is in the middle of the night. Uh, there's even some places that'll say, oh, well, snowy owls migrate uh, south because they hunt during the day and in the Arctic, you know, it's dark all winter. Uh, of course, that's uh, that's not true. They hunt throughout throughout the night. There's some that spend the winter in the Arctic around uh, polinias or open water where they hunt waterfowl all winter long and underneath the cover of darkness. But you'll see here that they actually use different habitats at night when they hunt. Um, similar to red-tailed hawks, they'll hunt in the medians of big roads and places like that and more open and more exposed areas where uh, they feel more secure. So last but not least, we're going to briefly touch on the fourth uh, northern owl species. This is the boreal owl, also called Tengmalm's owl in Europe. Um, this is one that uh, it's quite similar to a lot of other small owls uh, in terms of its ecology. Um, it's got a fairly wide range compared to the other owls that I've shown you. It's a montane species as well as a boreal species. Uh, you can see it goes down through the Rockies there and parts of Europe and the Middle East and uh, into Asia as well. This is a typical view. If you're lucky enough to see one during the day, um, they are very difficult to see. Out of all those owls that I've shown you, uh, this one by far is the hardest to see. George and I got lucky on the day before the tour, uh, this owl showed up in a Winnipeg city park and we got to see it. Unfortunately, they don't stick around, um, but the chance is always there uh, to see one of these birds during the day. It's very similar to another small owl found in uh, much of North America, the northern Sahuet. You can see here the differences. The Sahuet's bill is black. The boreal owl's bill is bone colored. Okay, very pale. The Sahuet has streaks in the crown and the boreal has spots. And the Sahuet has these big uh, brown streaks on the breast, whereas the boreal has a mixture of streaks and spots. This is what they eat. Again, uh, small mammals like voles and birds uh, are a staple. But one thing that they feed on that's quite bizarre here, at least in Ontario um, and in Canada, are flying squirrels. It's been uh, recorded uh, many times, uh, boreal owls feeding on flying squirrels. So a novel food item for them here, which is very neat. And this is a, a youngster there just uh, out of the nest. You can see the pale bill is evident even at this age. And this is a bird that on our tour we look for at night. This is really the only owl that we look for right in the depths of the night. Uh, we use playback to get them to come in. They're quite responsive uh, when they are around. Uh, usually when we do the tour, it's a little bit early for their calling period, just so that we have uh, the best chances of seeing the snowy and the great gray before they sort of disappear into the north. Um, but it, uh, there are good chances of seeing the boreal as well. So I'm gonna give you a little bit uh, of a, of a rundown of our Northern Owls tour. It's just a short little tour, just a week long, but uh, lots of bang for your buck. Uh, the little rock jumpers here on this map of Manitoba represent uh, places where we go on our tour. 
Um, they're not exact places, obviously, to protect the uh, the birds and uh, my secret spots. So don't you know, like zoom into the map and look exactly where the little rock jumpers are. That they're not exact locations. But um, the purpose of showing you this is just to show you um, that uh, we go to various different places to check for these owls. The reason for that is uh, not every year do the owls show up in the same place. Some years at Riding Mountain National Park, there's lots of owls. Some years there's none there, and there's a lot at Hecla and vice versa. So we, uh, we cover a good area uh, to search for these owls uh, to encounter them. And uh, while we're doing that, we also encounter a variety of other things. One of the things uh, that's very cool about Manitoba in the winter is that there are virtually no uh, red-tailed hawks. There's no rough-legged hawks. There are no kestrels. Uh, so the, really the only diurnal hawk that's very common in Manitoba in the winter is the goshawk. Um, and they're still not very common. Um, so what this means is when you're driving around and you see something sitting on a power line or a power post, it's almost certainly going to be an owl, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's our group uh, enjoying, literally, it was the first bird of the day. Uh, uh, it was a great gray owl in the first uh, 40 minutes of the tour, uh, right beside the road there. As you can see, it's very easy, uh, very easy walking. It's mostly roadside birding. Uh, the roads are very big. Uh, there's not very many people using them, so it's uh, very safe to walk along the shoulder and uh, look for all these cool owls. Of course, owls are not the only uh, exciting birds you see on a tour. We've also got a nice diversity of winter finches. So on the left, we have uh, the pine grosbeak, which is the pink one up at the top, and the evening grosbeak on the bottom left. Uh, we've got the crossbills, the white winged crossbill in the center and the red crossbill on the bottom right, and red poles up at the top uh, right, there's a hoary red pole. So these finches are just like the owls, they're cyclical. In some years, there's many of one and none of the other, and in some years, uh, vice versa. So for example, on our past tour, we encountered lots of crossbills of both species. We had beautiful views and singing and all kinds of interesting behavior, uh, but grosbeaks were almost absent. We only had one evening grosbeak. Uh, and this year, there's lots of both kinds of gross beaks and red poles, uh, but almost no crossbills. So one guest actually uh, mentioned that they'd want to try going on the tour again for another time to see how it's changed the dynamic, because the boreal is a, a very dynamic place. One thing that doesn't really change is uh, grouse. We see, um, we have the possibility of seeing three species on the tour. Uh, the one on the left, the sharp-tailed grouse, is one that we certainly, well, I shouldn't say certainly, but... Almost always, uh, we'll uh, get good looks at those. Uh, the one on the top right, the ruffed grouse, is another common species. And the prize at the bottom right there is the spruce grouse. So uh, they're not particularly easy to see in the winter, but uh, we are in habitat every single day of the tour, so our chances are good. And here's another selection of boreal species that... Um, that we have chances for on the tour, black-backed and three-toed woodpeckers. This is black-backed woodpecker on the left. Uh, quite scarce, uh, but again, we'll be in habitat uh, throughout the tour. Boreal chickadee is quite common, the upper right there, and uh, Canada jay or gray jay at the bottom right is, uh, is another common bird that we see, and often, uh, often quite tame. Mammals, too, actually play a big part in this trip, and there's chances for a variety of really great mammals. Uh, this is an American martin, a uh, fisher, uh, river otter, uh, lots of mustelids, least weasel, short-tailed weasel, uh, all kinds of uh, mustelids available uh, for your pleasure on the tour. Again, they're hard to see, uh, but uh, we do spend a lot of time in the habitat. Uh, lynx is um, sort of a highlight, I guess, of the trip. So Riding Mountain National Park is one of the best places in the world to see lynx. Uh, many folks have seen lynx um, and photographed lynx there uh, each year. Uh, we go at a pretty good time to, to try and see them when the males are actively roaming their territory and spraying kind of in February and March. Um, so it, the chance is there and it's a good chance, a uh, much better chance than most other places. Um, but even if you don't uh, see a lynx, the lots of driving that you do will will often pay off. So we on this past tour had a great view of this gray wolf. Uh, it just walked right out into the road. We were able to park and look at it. And uh, it went into the woods after a car had sort of chased it off. And we pulled over and I howled out of the window and it howled right back and uh, a couple of times actually. So it was a real sort of bone chilling experience and uh, certainly one of the highlights of the tour. 
So um, going back to, to owls there, I'm going to take you through some, uh, some nice tips on how to find an owl close to your home. I'm biased here for North American species because that's what I have around here. Uh, but these techniques work in any part of the world. Okay, so you can use them on any sort of owl, uh, pretty much uh, wherever you may be. So here's a selection of four common North American owls that a lot of uh, folks uh, in Northern North America may encounter on their travels. The great horned owl on the top left, the similar but smaller long-eared owl at the bottom left. On the right, we've got the northern sawhwet owl, which is a pop can sized bird. And uh, at the bottom right, sorry, we've got the uh, barred owl, which is a medium sized owl that's quite widespread through the States and Canada. So if you want to find a small owl, okay, small owls, um, because they are small, they use areas that uh, are very difficult for predators and potential owl searchers to, to find. So if you're looking for long-eared owls or other small owls, uh, dense deciduous thickets are places to check. Um, a lot of the time you might think that, oh, conifers are good places, but they also roost in deciduous thickets, but they have to be very, very dense and they have to have cover over the top. That seems to be uh, something that all owls prefer. Here's a little Northern sawwood owl, again, roosting in a white pine, but with cover above it. So big grape tangles uh, and things like that. In the neotropics, uh, this also works. This is a white-throated screech owl that I found in a big tangle, underneath a big tangle. So places to check. Um, you'd want to do this kind of systematically. You'll have to probably check a lot before you find one. But there are things that you can look for that'll make it easier. So this is a, a good example of a, a prime owl zone. Um, it's the back of a movie theater in a strip mall, but uh, beside it, there's a big field uh, that uh, has a lot of voles and other small mammals in it. And so these isolated little patches of habitat, uh, like dense conifers, uh, maybe big tangles again, uh, this along the edges of openings, uh, this is where you'd want to look for owls. So say we go into this little stand of spruces there, you look on the ground underneath perches and you'll find some signs of owls uh, if owls are there. So on the left, you'll see these two kind of uh, mouse colored uh, round things and those are called owl pellets. So owls, um, they don't have a crop, right? They don't have that sort of pre-digestion. So when they swallow their food whole, it goes directly into the gizzard and in there, it, the bones and the fur, things that are difficult to digest, that gets separated from the rest. The rest goes down into the owl's digestive tract and the owl coughs up the bones and the fur as a pellet, okay? And also because of this sort of pre-digestion uh, process, the owl's poop is very thick and pasty. It looks like paint. So it's very easy to recognize from a distance. Uh, so if you see this scene, uh, underneath a, a place that you've identified that uh, might hold owls, then you're in luck. This is a typical owl pellet here, just to show you the size. I went out and got a whole bunch of them uh, at a strip mall uh, about a couple, a couple of kilometers from where I live, just to show you. And if you pick them apart, you can see what the owl's been eating. It's a fun activity to do with kids because uh, it's always fun to sort through all the little bones. Uh, they're very clean. Uh, some people say that you should bake them for a while, but I find that that doesn't really uh, affect their taste uh, too much. I'm just kidding. Um, so it is a safe and, and fun activity to do if you've got kids and if you can find an owl. Another thing to look for is these mice that are hanging off of, uh, hanging off of trees. So uh, we talked about the hawk owl and how it uh, provisions food. It'll uh, store food. Other owls do that too. So the saw wet is a good example. Um, you'll often see these little deer mice sort of wedged in between branches. Uh, they don't impale their food like a shrike. So if you see things that are impaled on thorns, uh, shrikes are to blame. But if you see mice and bulls that are just crammed in branches, uh, it's possible that uh, an owl is around. And some owls, uh, screech owls and uh, scops owls in particular, um, they like to use cavities to, to roost in, okay? So another thing to look for, uh, big holes that uh, sometimes might have pellets at the base. Uh, and on very cold days, like this day, it was, uh, it was 20 degrees below uh, centigrade. This screech owl was out sunning itself on a, in the south-facing cavity. Um, so again, good, good thing to sort of keep in tune to if you want to find an owl near you. But probably your best bet for finding owls that are hidden and very difficult to find places are small birds, okay? They are much better at finding owls than you are. And when they find one, they make a racket, okay? So I'll... Uh, 
hopefully the sound works here. So you can see the calling frequency is much higher than typical. So it's not just birds communicating with one another, it's birds that are descended upon an owl and are now uh, teaching it a lesson. So it's a good uh, it's a good indicator and it's mostly how I find my small owls, to be honest. Bigger owls uh, can be easier to find. Uh, sometimes they sleep out in the open during the day. Okay, and uh, that makes them easier to find. Uh, crows are your friends when it comes to finding uh, bigger owls. They'll usually find them in Razor Racket as well. But there's something to be said about looking for owls at night. Okay, if you have the, the time and resources and a good patch of forest near you, uh, looking for owls at night is certainly very rewarding. Um, during the day, it's interesting, but often they're not really doing much. They're just asleep. But at night, they're moving around, they're calling, they're bringing food to their nest, uh, they're hunting, and they're, uh, it's much cooler, I think, to me, much more rewarding to see them behaving uh, naturally at night, uh, which is, of course, their time. All right, so last but not least, we're going to talk to you a little bit about owl etiquette. So these are special birds, and uh, because they're active at night and they're sleeping during the day, uh, there are um, certain implications when it comes to uh, viewing them in an ethical manner. So this is a picture that was published in the Vancouver Sun of, uh, this is 11 snowy owls together at Boundary Bay, which is a, a place where people go along the, the west coast there in Vancouver to see snowies and other owls. Um, it's not Photoshop, okay? This was a year where there were many that came down. So when owls appear, northern owls appear south of their regular range, uh, it could be for a variety of reasons. So for hawk owls, great gray owls and boreal owls, it's usually because they're food stressed, right? So their the vole population has crashed, they've come down. Uh, sometimes they're in okay shape and sometimes they're kind of hungry and they're hunting during the day. For snowy owls, it's recently been discovered that they will come south, of course, during food shortages, which is what happened here. Uh, but they'll also come south uh, for other reasons. For example, if they've had a good breeding year, um, in the north, they'll come down and there might be a lot of birds around, but banding studies have shown that they're in good condition. So uh, they're not starving. Um, but my sort of rule when I see an owl out during the day, especially if it's hunting during the day, is uh, it's probably starving and it needs to be given its space. Okay, it's very tempting to, you know, go up to these birds and try and get a, a close close up shot, but it's important to give it some space. Some owls are more tolerant of people than others, but uh, they do need their space to hunt. And uh, those that are sleeping during the day um, are required, they need to, to save energy as well. So it's a little bit different from watching regular birds. I mean, there's certainly a level of disturbance when uh, we're walking through the forest during the day and you know maybe playing some tape or flushing birds off the ground. But uh, those birds are active during the day. Uh, so they can, they're sort of built for that sort of disturbance. But owls, when they're sleeping, they really, uh, um, they really need their time to sleep. So, you can tell um, if you're too close to an owl by their body shape. I showed you the cryptic pose of the great gray. Uh, here's a long-eared owl, for example. On the left, the bird is clearly uh, stressed out. It does not want uh, whatever is nearby, in this case me, uh, getting any closer. It's very sort of upright. The ear tufts are, are way up. And uh, if I were to come closer to this bird, I would have flushed it, uh, which would have made it exposed to predators and things like that. Of course, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, the bird on the right there, it uh, it's very calm. It's asleep. Its eyes are closed. You can tell that it's it doesn't care about the distance that you're uh, that you're from it. So you can watch it for uh, as long as you'd like. Uh, again, this is another example of a small owl, a sawwood owl. On the left, you could see very clearly it's uh, not very happy. It's straightened out. Um, it's uh, maybe doing some bill clicking, letting you know that it's uh, it's not happy. This is one that very is very reluctant to flush because they're so small. So people often mistake their uh, reluctancy to flush as, uh, you know, as they're they're tame, uh, but they're not. So they do uh, they do get stressed if you're too close. If the bird uh, that you're watching looks like the bird on the right, it's asleep. It's completely calm. Uh, so that bird is uh, that's what you want when you find an owl. All right. Well, I think uh, that wraps it up. Uh, for me, thank you very much for uh, for giving me the time and place and uh, talking about these amazing birds with you. And I hope you uh, hope you learned some stuff and enjoyed the talk. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you out there in the field looking at uh, looking at some northern owls. Thank you very much.
Oh, thank you, Liv. That was beautiful. Really, really magical. And I'm um, looking out at all of the snow and just being so envious because it is so warm right now in Mauritius. Oh, don't <laughs> it's that. Enough <laughs> summer. Yeah, it's, I could use some warmth right now. <laughs> <laughs> we were just having a good laugh about it being a minus seven by you. And here it's just sweaty up a lip. So yeah, a couple of good yeah. questions have come in. Um, but first and foremost, what is your personal favorite species of owl, Liv? Oh, that is a very tough question. Um, I, oh, I don't even know. I think great gray owl has to be, uh, has to be one of my favorites. It, uh, it's such a big bird. And I remember um, in the winter of 2004, 2005, uh, it, was, it was just before I became a birder. Um, but it was a huge movement of these northern owls. And I saw actually a great gray owl sitting on uh, one of my neighbor's houses. And I didn't know what it was. I just knew that it was a, a big, huge owl and that it's something that I've never seen before. So that got me uh, really excited about it. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, lucky to see several more um, throughout my life, but it never gets old. You know, it, uh, when you round the corner and you see this big, huge thing in the woods and you know what it is right away, it's, uh, it's uh, a great feeling. Oh, wow. And in your opinion, uh, the rarest Northern uh, American owl species? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, all of the owls really are, I wouldn't say that they're rare per se. They're difficult to find sometimes and their low density is like the word that I like to describe uh, them as. But I think in terms of uh, difficulty to see, the boreal owl is, uh, is definitely up there. It's quite small. Uh, they rarely hunt during the day unless they're very hungry. And um, at night, you can you can see them uh, relatively easily in some places, but uh, it really is kind of a special special bird to to see if you can find it during the day. Oh, great! Um, then um, you mentioned the spotted owl being rare in Canada. What is the reason for this? We we hear it is it is a species under threat throughout its range. Yes, yeah. So in Canada, the population is just uh, literally a couple of birds now um, in the Cascades and other places. They're, so they're, it's deforestation, really. It's, they like mm -hmm. old growth, uh, big woods, which, of course, are very uh, valuable. So there's uh, a lot of uh, logging that goes on uh, still throughout their range in Canada, believe it or not. Um, and also competition with the barred owl. So we've got uh, these barred owls, which are native uh, to Canada. But um, they're sort of slowly been spreading westward, and uh, yeah. they're more aggressive than the spotted owls. They um, they're much easier to they're more adaptable, so they can live in uh, degraded habitat, whereas the spotted cannot. And uh, they actually even hybridize with the spotted owl sometimes. So that's another threat that uh, the spotted owl faces is this sort of uh, um, gene flow mm -hmm. between uh, barred and, and spotted. But it's really like it's. Uh, I don't think the barred owl, once we restore the habitat for the spotted owl, I think the barred owl is not going to be a huge problem. Like they, they talk about, you know, calls and control and things like that of the barred owl. Um, but it's really, I think, a short-term solution. Um, it's really the habitat, uh, very specific old growth uh, habitat that's valuable for both owls and, uh, and forestry. So that's unfortunately why the owl is in the position that it is right now. And Nigel um, Redman has asked, how many chicks do northern hawk owls successfully uh, fledge in Canada? On the 2019 rock jumper tour to Finland, we saw a pair with six fledged chicks. Presumably breeding success will depend on the availability of food prey, uh, which will vary from year to year. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, the same goes. Uh, the same goes for Canada there, Nigel. It, uh, up to six uh, have been recorded. Uh, when I saw the little one uh, at Rainy River, the little picture that I showed you, so that was three, three that were very large already, and they were maybe a week or so from becoming independent. Uh, so it really does. And it's, um, I think the, this one in North America is less dependent on voles than the European species. They fall back on other prey items here uh, quite often. Um, so it's not been tied here to redback voles um, very, very closely, um, like uh, like in some other places. But uh, 
yeah, it certainly depends. And all these owls too. I mean, snowy owls as well. Sometimes they can hatch, you know, six chicks. Uh, and in some years when the lemming population is low, uh, they can not breed at all. So yeah, it's uh, very uh, dependent on food availability. Um, uh, another uh, attendee has said, um, hi Liv, thanks for the informative owl presentation. A friend who monitors uh, and bans owls here in Saskatchewan uh, said that the owl, uh, snowy owls are experiencing a dramatic drop in the population worldwide. What have you heard? Oh, it's from Ron. Yeah, so snowy owl has recently been upgraded to threatened status. Um, it's difficult. It's a, a, a difficult bird to actually get a, a good handle on the population because its population is so cyclical that in some years, if, they, if there's several years of uh, very low lemming abundance, uh, their numbers will go down. They'll, their numbers will crash and uh, it'll appear that they're sort of on their way out. But it, all it takes is a couple of years of, uh, of good numbers and uh, they'll bounce right back again. So it's a difficult species um, in terms of conservation to sort of think about. Uh, but certainly their numbers have been steadily declining uh, from what I understand. And uh, that's sort of what their, what their uh, listing was, uh, was all about because of the steady decline that was noticed in their numbers. Uh, but it, again, it's a very difficult bird to census. In the winter, for example, uh, much of their wintering habitat in the north is inaccessible. So we don't really know how many stay up there. Um, there could be a lot if there's a lot of food. Um, yeah. it's, it's a species that even though it's big and popular and, uh, and relatively easy to study, there's very few... We're, we're learning a lot more about them now with new technologies like radio telemetry and things like that. Uh, but there's still a lot to be... Uh, discovered uh, about the snowy and it's still giving us a lot of surprises so a tough question with no clear answer um, another one here is uh, the Manitoba tour sounds really great but if coming from somewhere outside of North America it's far away for a week only is there any other birding opportunities available during that time of the year to consider in either Canada or the U.S.? Uh, yes. So um, in Manitoba in the winter, I would say that a week would get you pretty much everything that's around. It's very, it's quite sparse. Um, but if you're willing to combine, uh, for example, with uh, parts of Western Canada, if you go even into Saskatchewan, uh, you start getting into bigger sort of prairie-like uh, habitat. There's more jur falcons there, for example. Um, but it's really until you get into Alberta or British Columbia where you start to really see a difference and avifauna. If you combine it with Alberta, uh, we don't have an Alberta tour that uh, that's going right now, but maybe that'll change. Uh, you can get more owls there. There's uh, northern pygmy owls there, uh, for example. There's um, montane birds like dippers and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, solitaires. Um, quite good mammals. Yeah, there's uh, mountain goats and bighorn sheep and all kinds of stuff like that. So yeah, there's definitely uh, things to do, but uh, overall in Manitoba proper and uh, within, I would say, like 10 hours of driving um, from Manitoba in any direction except south into the States, uh, it's probably going to be very similar in the winter. It's very sparse. <laughs> um, Paul says, great presentation. Looking forward to next year's tour. Uh, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, Mary says, well, what? Yeah, Paul, yeah, it's going to be a good one. <laughs> um, Mary says, what city airport do trips start from and end in? Uh, yes, so the airport uh, is in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the capital of the province. It is serviced on a very regular basis from pretty much every major U.S. airport and uh, other airports as well. Often, if you're coming internationally, you'll fly into Toronto, and it's only a two-hour little jaunt from Toronto to Winnipeg. So, uh, On average, how many owls do you see on a tour? That is a very good question. Um, so it depends on the year, okay? And uh, I'll give you an example. This past year, we saw, I think, seven or eight northern hawk owls, which is, un which is incredible. Sometimes you see, you know, like one or two, but we saw seven or eight. Uh, we saw three great gray owls. We saw two snowy owls and a great horned owl. Um, but the number can change. I mean, I have been in the same route that uh, we did the tour 
in past years I've done, and I've seen over 30 great gray owls in a single day. Uh, of course, that year we saw only one or two hawk owls. Um, but yeah, it, it can be insane. I mean, it can, in some years you can see 15 or 20 snowy owls um, and things like that. So it's, it's quite good. But the reason that I think Manitoba is uh, the place to do this sort of tour is even if it's just a horrible year and all the owls are up north, you're in the breeding habitat uh, with the exception for snowy owl. Yeah. Um, so yeah. even if it's a dismal year for hawk owls or great gray owls, you can still find them. Um, you're not going to see, you know, 30 of them, but uh, they'll still be around. And really, you only need to get a really nice view of one. And of course, if there's only a couple around, you spend a lot more time watching them hunt and things like that. So, and snowy owl is annual uh, around Winnipeg. That's not, uh, that's not something that we think about missing. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Susan saying in Finland, um, she saw a great gray owl on a stick nest. Do great greys in Canada also use stick nests? They do. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, that's a very good point. They will use old stick nests of uh, of raptors like broad winged hawks and red tailed hawks. Those are the two sort of most common ones. Uh, raven nests they'll often use as well. Uh, in a lot of uh, boreal Canada, there's very little birds of prey uh, like red tailed hawks or ravens. So it really is. Um, a limiting factor, I think, for great gray owls is nest site selection in uh, the more northern parts of their range, where the trees just aren't big enough to support stick nests uh, for a lot of these big birds. So they end up nesting in, I call them chimneys, these like broken off top trees, uh, or sometimes in, uh, in like really big bowl-like cavities. That's pretty rare. And they'll also actually use artificial nest boxes. In Europe, uh, they often use uh, artificial nesting platforms. Oh, wow. Wow. Um... Uh, Louise um, asked, uh, is it Liv, of the 16 um, species that occur in Canada, is there a particular species that uh, occurs only in Canada? Uh, the answer to that is no. Yeah, so we share all of our owls with the United States. Yeah, they, uh, but the Alaska steals quite a few of them from, <laughs> from us. But uh, a lot of these birds you can find in the States, especially if, if you have good winters uh, where a lot of owls come south. Minnesota is a classic place uh, to go look for owls for folks who live in the States um, and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, we don't have any endemic owls uh, in Canada. In fact, we only have one endemic breeding bird, possibly two in Canada, and that's the Harris's sparrow and maybe Ross's goose, but I think that might be nesting in Alaska now. Um, and even those only breed here, they go to the States or elsewhere to winter. And uh, last question, because I see we're on the hour. Um, Jim is saying, how often do you see a gray falcon on your Manitoba tour? That's a good question. Uh, we've only done the Manitoba tour once so far, and we did not see a jur falcon. But I'd say okay. um, out if you're driving around, um, for four days in the habitat, you have a pretty good chance of encountering at least one. They're pretty, um, they range very, uh, they have big ranges, essentially, big wintering ranges. They're not one of these birds that, uh, like if there's a great gray owl, you know it's been hunting this one bog and it's just gonna be there every single day all winter. Uh, a jur falcon hunts over a huge range. So it's usually when we see them, they're on silos because there's pigeons that, that get attracted to the silos. And uh, so usually for a jur falcon, it's a, it's a long stakeout. You have to sort of stand there and freeze um, for several hours before before it comes by. But when it does, it usually tries to grab a pigeon. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, we... I have a network of uh, sort of local birders in Manitoba and they, they will let us know if there's a jur falcon being seen. Uh, when we were there with the tour, there wasn't, uh, there wasn't any reliable ones. So we didn't, uh, we spent a lot of time in the habitat, but we didn't end up encountering one. Uh, but they're often, I would say uh, more often than not, uh, there's some that are sort of semi-reliable. So the, the chances are quite good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah, that thanks guys. Fantastic, Lev. Um, yeah, super, super enjoyable. I mean, my experience with those northern owls are, are few and far between, but I remember going to the States in, in 2008 and, 
just looking at the owls and just thinking, oh my goodness, I have to get north at some point. And all of those, you start with northern hawk and you move to gray gray and yeah. oh, snowies. And it's, just, it's, all, it's all so exotic. Yeah. I mean, if you're used to any sort of um, South American or African or, or Australasian owls, those, those northern species are, are quite different. And yeah, yeah, there's something else. Yeah, exotic. each one has its own uh, special uh, aura. Yeah. Mm, yeah anytime if you, if you ever want to come up here you know there's the spot is yours yeah there's uh i've, I've got them all uh, i've got them all pinned down for you so. fantastic well I was, I, was, I was about to say as well i mean just you know just being there with somebody with as much knowledge as you've got is, is pretty special in itself i mean you know you, you clearly know them extremely well very intimately and that that is that's special uh, as well to be able to have that experience so thanks for sharing all of your knowledge with us it's uh, yeah a wonderful presentation and the photos as well just knockout i mean you know many many folks uh sent through their thanks and um yeah just just some amazing amazing pictures uh clearly a lot of time in the field yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah for sure all right well uh good stuff, good stuff. i'm for joe uh, biden <laughs> yeah absolutely i'm just going to quickly um f uh, just a quick reminder um you guys oh, yes. see the, the webinar mail actually uh going out i'm sure most of you but just a reminder that uh on the 3rd of february is going to be our next webinar so that's two weeks time and going off on a little bit of a different topic um we're going to be looking at birding from a beginner's point of view um so yeah a little bit of a different take on it um, so essentially looking at why do we love our feathered friends so much, what makes the hobby that many of us are so passionate about so enjoyable, what's that lure of birding, um, and is it just more than the birds themselves? Uh, obviously many of us know these answers um, quite well and they're often very personal as well. Um, but yeah, it definitely stems from a deep appreciation of our natural world. Um, so yeah, this, this particular webinar is going to be presented by uh, rock jumper guide Paul Varney. And I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to, um, to yeah, bring some, bring some friends and family along, perhaps those who have got a, a semi-interest in birds and, uh, and yeah, see what Paul has to say. I think it's going to be fascinating. Um, he's going to be going, um, yeah, visiting a variety of spots around the world and a variety of different families of birds as well. I think it's going to be a very entertaining talk. So, um, yeah, please do join us and Paul for that one. That's on the 3rd of February. And then, um, yeah, just a reminder again that all these webinars are recorded. Um, I know you guys are probably pretty familiar with that, but uh, they are recorded. You can view them later. The links will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours. And um, yeah, you can always go onto the Rock Jumper website as well. Just go to the webinars tab from the drop down menu um, on our website, and you can view any of the previously featured webinars there as well um, or via YouTube. And, uh, and then finally, again, these webinars are all being offered free of charge. And we're going to continue like this throughout the, throughout the rest of the year. And uh, we have still made our GoFundMe link open as well. Um, the guys are still locked down. They're still not able to travel. So 100% of those proceeds will again go directly to the guides. Um, yeah, thank you so much, folks. Um, yeah, enjoy the uh, what's left of the inauguration. I guess we're probably 10 minutes in or something like that. But uh, yeah. Do enjoy it, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. All right. See you there. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everyone.